Thanks, everyone. Um, I hope this was uh, these were enlightening uh, presentations by the folks that are seated on this here on the stage. And we have about 20 minutes, and so I have a couple of questions that I, I'd like to ask the folks here, but then really want to open it up to you guys. So if there are certain thoughts or questions or provocations that you want to throw out there, uh, to keep that in mind, and then uh, we'll be passing it over to you. So to start, um, one of the things that that really struck me with all of your presentations is the inclusive aspect of really um, thinking about who is your, your your beneficiary, who is your stakeholder group that you're working with, and how that is then informing uh, some of the broader policy decision making that's happening um, in the locality where you're working. And so maybe starting with you, Adine, could you could you speak to? It didn't come up so much in your presentation, but I, I know that you've been thinking a lot about this. What is the what has the process been like in terms of the insights you've been gaining from the the, the community work you've been doing um, to actually influence a lot of the um, resilience planning that's been going on at the municipality level. And then on the inverse of that, maybe Eric, could you then speak to um, some of the, the lessons learned from translating a lot of the uh, method development work that you've been doing um, in particular countries and then how that's um, had a lasting impact um, on some of the governments that you've been uh, working with? Uh, okay. Uh, I have case in the commission. Uh, commission have a uh, flood uh, uh, and landslide. Before that, before we have a uh, uh, festival, they want to make a demonstration because the government uh, promising that want to build some like a fortress or or drainage system to the kampung uh, from 2009, but until. Until uh, two months ago, there is no action because policy making is not good in the in Semarang, especially in Kemijen. After that, we want to make a, okay, you have a problem, but we want to attracting people. So we are using art, so we invite some of the artists to come and then to respond, becoming an artwork. And then we collaborate with your university in that area, so we make a discussion panels and then inviting the mayor of the city and then uh, after that the mayor of the city signing the the agreement about to uh, make a better drainage and then to make a like a fortress in the to avoiding the floods so basically uh, we using uh, our network to to push the issue to become more attractive and then make attention to the government or policy maker so they want to build something in that area that's uh, how we work. Great, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm assuming the question is sort of the, the lasting impact. Uh, specific, and since what we do is method development, it's a bit fuzzy, but uh, in all the countries where we work, we tend to engage with the local stakeholders, the NGOs, government agencies, to have some form of, I wouldn't call it capacity building, but some kind of knowledge transfer. Uh, but on the broader note, it's quite interesting to see the, the big uptake uh, and focus on these types of data sources. So I'm going to stay in Manila because next week there is a Philippine statistics uh, conference where mobile data is, is one of the key themes. So it's all, uh, a lot of government agencies, specifically now statistical agencies, are working uh, to build capacity around new data sources and mobile data sources. Uh, as a way to support SDG monitoring. Of course, we can't take all the credit for that, but it's, <laughs> it's a positive development. Great, thanks. And then maybe um, flipping it over uh, to Andrew and Angela, um, something that, that really struck me in, in both the We Robotics example, but then also through, I, I imagine, some of the partners you're working with and making all voices count is uh, the constellation of partners you really need to bring together in order to build a successful project and to ensure that uh, the outcomes are um, what the beneficiaries you're working with are um, hoping for. And so could you maybe speak to a little bit um, some of the both the successes and challenges or just some of the um, reflections on building out uh, partnership models that are sustainable and lead to lasting impact. Yeah, sure. Okay. Staying on? Yeah, so first you need someone like Angela, so, <laughs> uh, who, who actually knows how to do this. Um, the, uh, you know, I think the, the challenge that we've had in We Robotics is that uh, there's a lot of different stakeholders and they have different uh, interests, backgrounds, and understandings. So uh, local communities, different NGOs, uh, the government um, has a stake. 
uh, different parts of the government, Ministry of Health, uh, aviation, um, and then technology providers uh, who are essential to the work that uh, we are trying to accomplish. And I think uh, what we've had to do um, is learn a lot of different languages. Uh, you uh, have to be able to, to sort of speak to what are the questions that are actually preoccupying uh, the folks that you're trying to work with. Uh, uh, technology providers uh, don't actually share the same language um, as uh, NGOs or, or uh, a lot of the local government partners. And um, it's not okay to just speak one language and assume that everyone is going to understand that. Um, and that requires, uh, and I, I really like the uh, discussion about these skills for resilience. Uh, it requires patience, um, it requires humility, it requires um, a willingness to really take the time to listen to the problems that people are actually trying to solve, which I thought was also a great point in the, the, your Flowminder presentation about, you know, data is just an input. The key is having the right questions. You've got to know what is the right um, issue to solve. And that, again, requires these skills for resilience, to really listen to people um, and, and uh, sort of think through what language they're going to actually understand you in. From our side, I would say the two greatest relationships are with government and with the stakeholders. So those are the areas where our projects need to do a lot of work because oftentimes they have the tech down pat, but they need to work on those, um, those areas and that's actually where a lot of my job comes in. Mm -hmm. So setting them up with mentors who can help uh, hold their hands and introduce them to the right people and help them create value propositions for each of the people who they're working with because as Andrew has pointed out, um, a business will have different needs and requirements from a government and different from the citizen on the ground who's actually affected by the crisis at hand. So I think those are the two major skills. That's helpful and I think just one, one final question for me, I think that really can uh, open to all of you to, to opine on, but thinking about uh, sustainability, both of your, your respective organizations, but also um, how you really maintain that inclusive approach in terms of how you grow um, and, and, and further uh, refine your, your solution and your, your interaction with the, the groups that you're working with. So could um, whoever wants to take this one, uh, it's open, really maybe speak to the, um, what are some of the considerations that are taken into account and what are, who are, what are some of the, maybe the, the flags that are worth raising for some of the folks in this room who are really launching um, uh, new projects or new ideas that should be taken into account to ensure the sustainability of their project um, uh, into the future? Dean, that's definitely you. <laughs> Feel free. Yeah. Um, I mean, just one thing I'll throw out there is that um, sustainability uh, means uh, adaptation. So uh, you have to be able to uh, not just sort of uh, sustain one form of activity, but be able to actually um, move that activity as uh, the world uh, causes you to have to adapt to new situations. Um, and whether that's new funding sources, whether that's new business models, uh, whether that's uh, you know, other ways of thinking about problems. So uh, for us, I mean, we, we had a discussion about how to sustain one organization, U Aviators, uh, Humanitarian UAV Network, um, and that actually spun into a discussion about um, creating another organization as a form of sustainment um, and a way to answer a number of uh, kind of the core dilemmas that were in that previous organization. So, so that adaptive capacity is actually, I think, um, often not sort of understood properly as the heart of what it is that you're sustaining and that sustainability that becomes too static, that you're just trying to keep things going for the sake of keeping them going. Uh, okay, to so being sustained, I think, or my organization, it's about, uh, that's the important, important thing too. So, uh, 2011, maybe, uh, we are, uh, graduated from the university and then we don't know uh, how to make this uh, sustain because we cannot afford money for from uh, our activity so our all of us is working with the other organization or a corporate and then we uh, saving my uh, our money and our time to make us uh, something because we we choose to be like this 
uh, and then after that there is some uh, organization that give us some funding but not uh, not for, for sustainability but I think the the important thing is uh, we have faith that uh, we want to contribute the city because if every, uh, everything that happened in the city will come back to us and then and uh, our expertise just in art and communicating with uh, people so that's uh, that's that we we want to push and then we want to survive because you want to contribute to the city i would talk about sustainability from two perspectives the first is partnerships uh, for making all voices count a lot of oh, not a lot of uh, a number of our projects have been taken up by governments and then they become policy. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they become sustainable and a long-term thing. But sometimes I think when we work in this space, we forget that if we do our job right, then we should get ourselves out of a job. So sometimes your organization will die because you've done the work that needs to be done and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's when you need to pivot and look for something else that you can apply your energies and passion to. So. I think of sustainability as doing a good job in an effective and efficient manner, not necessarily living for 100 plus years. Great. Great. And then i um, happy to open it up now if there are any questions from folks in the audience. Looks like we've got one over there. <laughs> uh, thank you to the panel. Um, this one's for Andrew, but anyone can answer. Um, I was just wondering, when you're sending out equipment, uh, how do you ensure, oh, and then you guys leave, how do you ensure that it's used properly and that it doesn't just get put on a shelf somewhere um, and that they're actually making use of the data that they obtain from the equipment? Oh, we might. You know, they, they confuse us with these multiple microphone things. <laughs> uh, uh, so I think, um, the short answer is that um, we're getting data back from projects that are being de uh, developed with the technology that we're sending out. So um, the data is the proof that uh, the project is ongoing and that it uh, requires certain kinds of um, hardware in order to be able to accomplish. So um, having gotten that back and then collaboratively working on the analytics on that um, is uh, the way that we're uh, sort of keeping the global di um, sort of global local dynamic going um, and making sure that that, that um, hardware stays in use. Um, and it's not hard, actually. Um, I think uh, it's harder to keep the, with drones, for instance, it's harder to keep it out of their hands, quite frankly. Um, like, you know, you show up and I get mobbed by children who want to take <laughs> your toys and play with them. Um, and uh, then the children are like 45-year-old guys that want to be able to like go out and map a field. So um, I think it's, in, in our case, it just is not a problem because people are really excited about it and, and just want to get out there and do that work. And, and having access to it means that they will get out there far more than we ever thought they would. Um, and I think that's been a great uh, learning experience. Anyone else? It's the end of the day. Come on, guys. <laughs> Nothing else. All right. I think we're going to finish early, if that's the case. Last call. No? All right. Oh, in the back, we've got one. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my question would be for, uh, for the making all voices count. So what if there are voices that may not be heard? So how, how about, how do we address, for, because for me, an inclusive for innovation involves persons with disability, persons with um, special needs, and actually there is a challenge to map these people in um, disaster areas. And they're included in that um, intervention where we need them to be resilient as well. So how have you considered including them in your target stakeholders or beneficiaries, and how inclusive really are your organizations in addressing this um, one challenge? Thank you. Thank you. That's a really insightful question. So um, if you look at all the words in making all voices count, um, there are some think pieces that uh, we've put outside that explain how we do the making. And your question addresses the all part of that. So inclusivity is a huge focus for us. 
and it's actually one of the indicators that we measure our projects on. How are you including women? How are you including people with disabilities? How are you including LGBTQ people? How are you um, even using technologies that are accessible to illiterate people? How are you using um, technologies that can work in areas where there's no connectivity? So we try and actually have that as a key indicator for our projects. Um, you saw JD's presentation this morning. Uh, the posters they're using address inclusivity in terms of uh, low technology and also literacy because anyone can understand a picture of people in a bar chart. You don't necessarily need to read the figures. So that's how we address inclusivity by being open to any and all forms and not necessarily focusing on innovation as being high tech, but innovation being an effective way of how we do things. So. Great. A quick question. Yeah, I, I was I, I was thinking about your um, opening discussion about resilience and uh, sort of how the Rockefeller Foundation, for instance, as an actor, thinks about this. I'm, I'm wondering how happy we are with the term resilience. Um, you know, we use the words we have because we need to have some kind of common vocabulary. Um, but, you know, it does seem like there are some clear drawbacks to that. I mean, you know, when I think about what we're trying to accomplish, I think of it uh, not as sort of bouncing back or, uh, you know, I, I think about it as trying to transform the situation so that there's a new set of, uh, there's a new set of possibilities that is on offer. Um, and that that set of possibilities is better than what existed before, that there's significant progress. Whereas, Resilience often sounds to me as though we're kind of, uh, you know, at least you get back to baseline. Um, how, do you, how do you guys think about so, it? So, I mean, that's a, that's a good point, but I think the, at least the, the way that we think about resilience at Rockefeller Foundation is really, uh, it's adapting, but it's also transforming when required. And so I think if there's a, if there's a situation where the status quo isn't uh, sufficient, then there really needs to be a paradigm shift and there needs to be a new way of working and operating. And just to give maybe an example of um, how we do this, uh, we have a program called 100 Resilient Cities, which I think many of the folks in this room are probably familiar with, um, where we're actually working with city governments and we're, we're um, working with them both to develop a contextual resilience strategy for that individual city, um, but then connecting them with partner organizations, NGOs, academics, uh, private sector, et cetera, uh, to actually work with them and to, to push them to change and to um, enable them to change uh, uh, when needed. And so I think there's, there's, there's oftentimes an opportunity to, uh, to change the system, and uh, sometimes it needs to be a little push to get there. But that's just my reflection on it. All right, so I think oh, we have one more, and then I think we're at time. So last question of the day. Okay, uh, this is an open question for everybody. I think uh, most of these uh, initiatives and projects, I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on about scaling these initiatives and sustaining those uh, types of initiatives. For example, if you have these types of technologies, drone technologies, community-based organizations or processes, and even uh, capacity building, there's always a question about scaling them. For example, in the Philippines, there are over a thousand uh, local government units and if you have uh, a grant-funded uh, project or program, it's only sp specific to a few of these sites. And now, when these programs are over, these organizations leave. And even if there are local organizations taking uh, initiative, how do you now try to scale these up to the other sites that are often neglected in all of these initiatives? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> That's actually one of the questions that Making All Voices Count has. How do we scale? Uh, should you scale or should you assume that because this worked well in this context, it will necessarily work in another context? So talk to me in one year's time when we have amassed <laughs> all our learning, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a data-based answer for that. But just from my experience with our scaling projects, um, there's the clear understanding that what got you here won't get you there. So our organizations need a new set of skills and a new set of capabilities and also to think anew about the problems that um, they'll face when they scale. 
because there are some things that are not a problem when you're operating in one barangay or in one province. But you try and move out of, say, Metro Manila, now you have big problems. So I don't have an answer for that. That's a great question. <laughs> and hopefully, we will have an answer. Uh, can I can actually bring up <clears throat> what I think is one of the hurdles, and uh, Hunter knows because I've, I've brought it up. So if, if you want to have innovation pilot money to do like the first project, it's easy. Endless pilot money, $100,000. It's so, so easy to get pilot money. So many pilots are being done. That one, I think it was Uganda that put in a moratorium. So the government <laughs> a few years back said, no more pilots. We've had 400 pilots. and. Uh, they just keep on coming, but there is no scaling. So we don't want to have any more pilots. This was specifically in M Health, I think. But um, yeah, so pilots, super easy. And then there are all these great pilots being done. And then you see, oh, now we want to scale. And then there is no scaling money because uh, there is a gap. So this is just as an economist, this seems to be it's a whole industry of its own. You have endless pilot money, and organizations handing out pilot money, and then Next step is $20 billion, a 10-year program. And then it's Asian Development Bank or UN or something like that. Because, and yeah, there could be many reasons. It could be that it's just so much money, it's too much work to, to, to fill that scaling gap. Or uh, I don't know why, really. But it's, um, to me, it's, it's uh, the gap between $100,000 and $100 million, And it's pretty empty. So if <laughs> some donors are willing to fill that, it would be great. OK. <laughs> I, I would take it from a slightly different angle, though, um, that what is the appropriate scale of a project? Um, so often, the concept of scale comes to us, and maybe just because we're nerds, uh, we think about this from, from the standpoint of technology companies, say, that you hear about scaling uh, you know, a startup or what have you. And, and that has to do with getting bigger, becoming a standard, uh, uh, you know, entry into uh, or dominating a winner-takes-all market. That's, that's the kind of concept in the commercial side. I don't really think it works that way in, uh, in the kinds of problems that we're, that we're trying to address. I think that uh, what's much more relevant is um, finding um, the contextually specific appropriate solution um, and making sure that those things um, uh, continue to operate in their contextually specific conditions. Um, and that other people are able to learn about them. Um, and even if you don't scale that project, um, that you're able to scale the concept or the idea or transfer it or hybridize it or move it somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, that's a little bit different than, than the idea that, you, that, that you're not successful unless you jump to $100 million. You could be perfectly successful at a, at a, at a fairly small level. Um, and in fact, actually, so like to use the Uganda example, what they were mad about was sort of not scaling, but they were mad that people weren't interoperating. Um, so data was being produced by a lot of these projects that didn't talk to each other. Um, and that made it really difficult to have a, you know, 1,000 or 8,000 different mHealth projects. Maybe actually you needed 8,000 different projects only under conditions where that data could actually move and people could understand across different systems. And so I think it's much more important. And I've learned this from working in, in now, um, you know, I, I, I'm kind of weird, so I, I uh, learned a lot of different uh, projects. And, and one of the things I learned from robotics is that you have to design for um, the, the situation at hand. Um, you know, if in commercial, even in using commercial technology, you have to be able to, to design the API or the, uh, the, the, the software application or the particular sensor configuration to solve a particular problem. Um, and whether that turns into a million units or not, that's not my problem. Um, I, I, I think that would be a much healthier, like even mentally healthier way to approach the idea. Great. Thank you all very much. I think on that note, we're out of time. Um, Thanks again, and uh, that's it. <laughs>